Hi there, my name is William Kircher, and this is my reading of Kenneth Graham's Wind in the Willows. Thank you. The mole had been working very hard all morning, spring cleaning his little home. Uh, first with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs, with a brush and a pail of whitewash, until he had dust in his throat and his eyes and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur, and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above and in the earth below him. It was small wonder then that he suddenly flung down his brush on the floor and he said, Bother! Hang spring cleaning! And he bolted out of the house without even waiting to put on his coat. Something up above was calling him imperiously, and he made for a steep little tunnel, and he scraped and he scratched and he scrabbled and scrooged till at last, pop, pop, out came his snout into the sunlight, and he found himself rolling in the warm grass of a great meadow. This is fine, he said to himself. This is better than whitewashing. It all seemed too good to be true. Hither and thither, through the meadows, he rambled busily, along the hedgerows, across the copses, finding everywhere birds building, flowers budding, leaves thrusting, everything happy and progressive and occupied. He thought his happiness was complete, when as he meandered aimlessly along, suddenly he stood by the edge of a full-fed river. Never in his life had he seen a river before. This sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal, chasing and chuckling, gripping things with a, a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh, to fling itself on fresh playmates that shook themselves free and were caught and held again. All was a shake and a shiver. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. By the side of the river, he trotted as one trots when very small, by the side of a man who holds one spellbound by exciting stories. And when tired at last, he sat on the bank while the river still chattered onto him. He sat on the grass and looked across the river. Just then, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye. And as he gazed, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, vanished, and then twinkled once more like a tiny star. But it could hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation, and it was too glittering and too small for a glowworm. And then, as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye, and a small face began gradually to grow up around it like a frame around a picture. A brown little face with whiskers. A grave round face with the same twinkle in its eye that had first attracted his notice. Small neat ears and thick silky hair. It was the water rat. The two animals stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hello, Mole, said the water rat. Oh, hello, rat, said the mole. Would you like to come over? inquired the rat presently. No, oh, it's all very well to talk, said the mole, rather pettishly, he being new to the river and riverside life and its ways. The rat said nothing, but stooped and unfastened a rope and hauled on it, and then lightly stepped into a little boat. It was painted blue outside and white within, and was just the size for two animals, and the mole's whole heart went out to it at once. The rat sculled smartly across and made fast and then he held up his forepaw as the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Now then, come on, step lively. And the mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated in the stern of a real boat. This has been a wonderful day, said he, as the rat shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know, I've never been in a boat before in all my life. What? cried the rat, open mouth. Never been in a what? Ne never been in a... Well, I... What, what have you been doing then? Well, is it, is it so nice as all that? Asked the mole shyly, though he was quite prepared to believe it as he leant back in his seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, the rollocks, and all the fascinating fittings and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Nice? Well, it's the only thing, said the water rat solemnly as he leant forward for a stroke. Oh, believe me, my young friend, there is nothing. Absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats, eh? Simply messing about, he went on dreamily, messing about, and oh, look ahead, rat, said the mole. Suddenly, it was too late. 
The boat struck the bank full tilt, and the dreamer, the joyous oarsman, lay on his back at the bottom of his boat, his heels up in the air. Oh, messing about in boats, the brat went on composedly, picking himself up with a pleasant laugh. Oh, in him or out of him, it doesn't matter. Nothing really seems to matter. That's the charm of it, whether you get away or whether you don't, whether you arrive at your destination or with, whether you reach somewhere else or whether you never get anywhere at all. You're always busy and you never do anything in particular. Look here, look here. If you've really nothing else on hand this morning, suppose we drop down the river together, eh? And we'll have a long day of it. The mole waggled his toes from sheer happiness, spread his chest with a, a sigh of full contentment, and leaned back blissfully into the soft cushions. <gasps> what a day I'm having, he said. Let us start at once. Oh, hold hard a minute then, said the rat. He looped the painter through a ring in the landing stage, climbed up into his hole above, and after a short interval, it reappeared, staggering under a fat, wicker luncheon basket. Here, you shove that under your feet, he observed to the mole as he passed it down into the boat. Then he untied the painter, and he took to the skulls again. Well, what's inside it? asked the mole, wriggling with curiosity. Oh, well, there's, uh, there's cold chicken inside it, replied the rat briefly. Cold tongue, uh, cold ham, yeah, cold beef, pickled gherkins, uh, salad, French rolls, watercress, sandwiches, spotted meat, uh, ginger beer, lemonade. Oh, 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 stop, stop, cried the mole in ecstasies. This is, this is too much. <laughs> well, you, you really think so, inquired the rat seriously. Well, it's only what I always take on these little excursions. And the other animals are always telling me that I'm a mean beast and I cut it very fine. <laughs> The mole never heard a word he was saying, absorbed in the new life he was entering upon, intoxicated with the sparkle, the ripple, the scents, the sounds and the sunlight. He trailed a paw in the water and dreamed long waking dreams. The water rat, like the good little fellow where he was, sculled steadily on. I like your clothes, awfully old chap. Rat remarked after some half an hour or so had passed. Yeah, I'm going to get myself a black velvet smoking suit myself someday, eh? Right? As soon as I can afford it. I beg your pardon, uh, said the Mole, pulling himself together with an effort. You, you must think me very rude, but this is all so new to me. So, so this is, is a river. The river, corrected the Rat. And you really live by the river? What a jolly life. Oh, buy it, would it? On it and in it, said the rat, it's my world and I don't want any other. What it hasn't got is not worth having, and what it doesn't know is not worth knowing. Lord, the times we've had together, hey? What, what lies over there? asked the mole, waving a paw towards a background of woodland that darkly framed the horizon. Oh, that, oh, uh, that's uh, just the wild wood, said the rat shortly. Ah, uh, we don't go there very much, we river bankers. Well, aren't they, uh, Aren't they very nice people in there? said the mole a trifle nervously. Well, replied the rat, let me see. Uh, well, the squirrels, they're all right. And the rabbits, some of them, but uh, you know, rabbits, they're a mixed lot. And there's Badger, of course. Yeah, he lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else either if you paid him to do it. Dear old Badger, nobody interferes with him. And I'd better not, he added significantly. Well, why? why? Who should interfere with him? asked the mole. Well, you know, of course, there are others, explained the rat in a hesitating sort of way. Weasels and, and stoats and, and foxes and so on. <clears throat> oh, they're all right in a way. You know, I'm very good friends with some of them. Pass the time of day when we meet and all that. But they break out sometimes. There's no denying it. And then, oh, you can't really trust them. Yeah, that's the fact. The mole knew quite well that it's against animal etiquette to dwell on possible trouble ahead. So we dropped the subject. Leaving the main stream, they now passed into what seemed like a little landlocked lake. Green turf sloped down to either edge, brown snaky tree roots gleamed below the surface of the quiet water. The rat brought the boat alongside the bank, helped the still awkward mole safely ashore, and swung out the luncheon basket. The mole begged as a favour to be allowed to unpack it all by himself, and the rat was very pleased to indulge him, and to sprawl at full length on the grass and rest while his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it and took out all the mysterious packets one by one and arranged their contents in due order, still gasping, oh my, oh my, at each fresh revelation. 
And when all was ready, the rat said, Now, pigeon, old fellow. And the mole was indeed very glad to obey. When they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlour and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it, having fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him and told him river stories till supper time. Now this day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole, each of them longer and full of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learned to swim and to row and entered into the joy of running water and with his ear to the reed stems, he caught at intervals something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them. Ratty, said the mole suddenly one bright summer morning, if you please, I want to ask you a favour. And what I wanted to ask you was, um, won't you take me to call upon Mr. Toad? You know, I've heard so much about him and I, I do so want to make his acquaintance. Well, certainly, said the good-natured rat, jumping to his feet and dismissing poetry from his mind for the day. Get the boat out, we'll paddle up there at once. He must be a very nice animal, observed the mole as he got into the boat and took to the skulls. Oh, he is indeed the best of animals, replied the rat. He's so simple, so good-natured and so affectionate. Yeah, perhaps he's not very clever. Uh, we can't all be geniuses. It may be that he is both boastful and conceited. Oh, but he has got some great fellows. Great qualities. Great. He's a great fellow. Oh, there's Toad Hall now, said the rat. And that creek on the left, that leads to his boathouse. That's where we'll leave the boat. Toad is rather rich, you know. And this is really one of the nicest houses in these parts, though we never admit as much to Toad. They disembarked and strolled across the gay flower-decked lawns in search of Toad, whom they presently happened upon resting in a wicker garden chair with a preoccupied expression of face and a large map spread out on his knees. Hooray! <gasps> he cried, jumping up on seeing him. Well, this is splendid! He shook the paws of both of them warmly, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you, he went on, dancing around them. I, I, was, I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once. You don't know how lucky it is you turning up here just now. Oh, well, let's just sit quiet a bit, Toady, said the rat, throwing himself into an easy chair, while the mole took another by the side of him and made some civil remark about Toad's delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river, cried Toad boisterously, or anywhere else for that matter. Could not help adding. Now, now, look here. Yeah, you are the very animals I wanted. You've got to help me. It's very important. Then you, you come with me, dear Ratty, and you, your amiable friend also, and you shall see what you shall see. He led the way to the stable yard accordingly, the rat following with a most mistrustful expression, and there, drawn out, out of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted a canary yellow, picked out with green and red wheels. There you are, cried the toad, straddling and expanding himself. Hey, there's real life for you. Hmm, the open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling downs, oh, camps, villages, towns, cities. Here today, off, off, somewhere else tomorrow. Travel, change, interest, excitement. The whole world before you. And mind, this is the very finest of the cart that, saw, uh, that was ever built, without any exception. You come inside and look at the arrangements. I planned them all myself, I did. The mole was tremendously interested and excited. A rat only snorted and thrust his hands deep into his pockets, remaining where he was. It was indeed very compact and comfortable. Little sleeping bunks, a little table that folded up against the wall, a cooking stove, lockers, bookshelves, pots, pans, jugs, kettles of every size and variety. All complete, said the toad triumphantly, pulling open a locker. You see, there's biscuits, potted lobster, sardines, everything you could possibly want. You'll find that nothing has been forgotten when we make our start this afternoon. I beg your pardon, said the rat slowly as he chewed a straw, but to die here over here. You say something about we, huh? And start and this afternoon? Oh, no, my dear old ratty, said Toad imploringly. Don't begin talking in that sniff and, and stiffy sort of way, because you know you've got to come. I can't possibly manage without you. I want to show you the world. I'm going to make an animal of you, my boy. Come along, come over. We'll have some lunch, he said more diplomatically, and we'll talk it over. We needn't decide anything in a hurry, of course. Yeah, I... 
I don't really care. I don't want to give pleasure to my you fellows. <laughs> Live for others. Huh? That's my motto in life. And during luncheon, which was excellent, of course, as everything at Toad always was, the Toad simply let himself go. And disregarding the rat, he proceeded to play upon the inexperienced mole as on a harp. Somehow, it soon seemed taken by Grant, for granted by all three of them, that the trip was a settled thing. And when they were quite ready, the now triumphant Toad led his companions to the paddock and set them to capture the old grey horse. <coughs> Meanwhile, Toad set to work, packing the lockers still tighter with necessaries. At last, the horse was caught and harnessed, and they set off, all talking at once. It was a golden afternoon. The smell of the dust they kicked up was rich and satisfying. And out of thick orchards on either side of the road, birds called them and whistled to them cheer cheer cheerily. And good-natured wayfarers passing them gave them good day, or stopped to say nice things about their beautiful cart. And rabbits, sitting at their front doors in the hedgerows, held up their forepaws and said, oh my, oh my, oh my. And late in the evening, tired and happy and miles from home, they drew up on a remote common far from habitations, turned the horse loose to graze, and ate their simple supper sitting on the grass by the side of the cart. Toad talked big about all he was going to do in the days to come, while the stars grew fuller and larger all around them, and a yellow moon appearing suddenly and silently from nowhere in particular came to keep them company and listen to their talk. And at last they turned into their little bunks in the cart, and Toad, kicking out his legs, sleepily said, Ooh, Well, good night, you fellows. This is the real life for a gentleman. Mm. After so much air and excitement, the toad slept very soundly, and no amount of shaking could rouse him out of bed next morning. So, while the rat sorted the horse and lit a fire and cleaned last night's cups and platters and got things ready for breakfast, the mole trudged off to the nearest village, a long way off, for milk and eggs and various necessaries the toad had, of course, forgotten to provide. The two animals were resting, thoroughly exhausted by the time Toad appeared on the scene, fresh and gay, and remarking, what a pleasant, easy life it was they were all leading now, hmm, after the cares and worries and fatigues of housekeeping at home. They had a pleasant ramble that day over grassy downs and along narrow by lanes, and it was not until the afternoon that they came out on the high road, their first high road, and there, disaster, fleet and unforeseen sprang out at them. Like the drone of a distant bee. Glancing back, they saw a small cloud of dust with a dark center of energy advancing on them at an incredible speed. While out from the dust, a faint boop boop wailed like an uneasy animal in pain. In an instant, the peaceful scene was changed, and with a blast of wind and a whirl of sound that made them jump for the nearest ditch, it was on them. Poo, poo, rang with a brazen shout in their ears, and they had a moment's glimpse of an interior of glittering plate glass and rich Morocco, and the magnificent motor car, immense, breath-snatching, passionate, with its pilot tense and hugging his wheel, possessed all earth and air for the fraction of a second. It flung an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly. The old grey horse simply abandoned himself to his natural emotions. Rearing, plunging, backing steadily, he drove the cart backwards towards the deep ditch at the side of the road. It wavered for an instant, and then there was a heart-rending crash. And the canary-coloured cart, their pride and joy, lay on its side in the ditch, an irredeemable wreck. The rat had danced up and down in the road, simply transported with passion. You villains, he shouted, shaking both fists. You scoundrels, you highwaymen, you road hogs! I'll have the law on you. Toad sat straight down in the middle of the dusty road, his legs stretched out before him and stared fixedly in the direction of the disappearing motor car. He breathed short. His face wore a placid, satisfied expression. And at intervals, he faintly murmured, Poop! Poop! The mole went to look at the cart on its side in the ditch. The rat came to help him, but the united efforts were not sufficient to right the cart. Toad! they cried. Come and bear a hand, can't you? The toad never answered a word or budged from his seat in the road. The rat shook him by the shoulder. Are you coming to help us, toad? he demanded sternly. 
<laughs> Glorious! Stirring sight! murmured Toad, never offering to move. The poetry of motion! The real way to travel! The only way to travel! Here today, in next week, tomorrow, villagers skipped, towns and cities jumped! Always somebody else's horizon. Oh, bliss. Oh, poo 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 What are we going to do with him? asked the mole of the water rat. Nothing at all, replied the rat firmly, because there's really nothing that can be done. He is now possessed. He's got a new craze, and it always takes him this way in its first stage. He'll continue like that for days now, like an animal waking, walking in a happy dream. Quite useless for all practical purposes. Oh, God, never mind him. Let's go and see what there is to be done about the cart, huh? A careful inspection showed them that even if they succeeded in writing it by themselves, the cart would travel no longer. The rat knotted the horse's veins over his back and took him by the head. Come on, he said grimly to the mole. There's five or six miles to the nearest town. We shall just have to walk it. The sooner we make a start, the better. On reaching the town, they went straight to the station and deposited Toad in a second-class waiting room. And then they left the horse at an inn stable and gave what directions they could about the cart and its contents. Eventually, a slow train, having landed them at a station not very far from Toad Hall, they escorted the spellbound sleepwalking Toad to his door, put him inside it, and instructed his housekeeper to feed him, undress him, and put him to bed. The following evening, the mole was sitting on the bank fishing when the rat came strolling along to find him. Heard the news, he said. Toad went up to town by an early train this morning and he's ordered a large and very expensive motor car. It was a bright morning in the early part of summer. The river had resumed its accustomed pace, and a hot sun seemed to be pulling, pulling everything green and bushy and spiky up out of the earth towards him, as if by strings. The mole and the water rat had been up since dawn and were finishing breakfast in their little parlour and eagerly discussing their plans for the day when a heavy knock sounded at the door. Oh, bother, said the rat all over egg. See who it is, mole, like a good chap, since you're finished. The mole went to attend the summons, and the rat heard him utter a cry of surprise. <gasps> Mr. Badger! The badger strode heavily into the room and stood looking at the two animals with an expression full of seriousness. The rat let his egg spoon fall on the tablecloth and sat open-mouthed. The badger said heartily, Oh, then. Tell us the news from your part of the world, huh? How's old Toad going on? Oh, from bad to worse, said the rat gravely. Another smash-up only last week and a bad one. You see, he will insist on driving himself and he's hopelessly incapable. He's convinced he's a heavenly-born driver and nobody can teach him anything. How many has he had? inquired the badger gloomily. What, smashes or machines? asked the rat. Oh, well, it's all the same thing. After all, with Toad, I mean, this is the uh, seventh. He's been in hospital three times, put in the mole, and as for the fines he's had to pay, well, God, it's simply awful to think of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's part of the trouble, continued the rat. Toad's rich, we all know that, but he's not a millionaire, and he's hopelessly bad driver. Killed or ruined, it's going to be one of those two things sooner or later. Badger, we're his friends, wouldn't we ought to do something? The hour has come, said the badger at last with great solemnity. What hour? asked the rat uneasily, glancing at the clock on the mantelpiece. Toad's hour of Toad's hour, of course, cried the mole excitedly. This very morning, continued the badger, another new and exceptionally powerful motor car will arrive at Toad Hall on approval or return. You two animals will accompany me instantly to Toad Hall and the work of rescue shall be accomplished. Right you are, cried the rat, starting up. They set off, off down the road on their mission of mercy, Badger leading the way. They reached the carriage drive off Toad Hall to find, as Badger had anticipated, a shiny new motor car of great size, painted a bright red, 
Toad's favourite colour, standing in front of the house. As they neared the door, it was flung open, and Mr. Toad, arrayed in goggles, gap gaiters, and enormous waistcoat, came swaggering down the steps, drawing on his gauntleted gloves. Oh, hello, you fellows, he cried cheerfully on catching sight of them. You're just in time to come with me for a jolly... You're just in time to come for a jolly... For a jolly... His hearty accents faltered and fell away as he noticed the stern, unbending look on the countenance of his, of his silent friends, and his invitation remained unfinished. The badger strode up the steps. Take him inside, he said sternly to his companions, and then as Toad was hustled through the door, struggling and protesting, he turned to the chauffeur in charge of the new motor car. I am afraid you won't be needed today, he said. Mr. Toad has changed his mind. And then he followed the others inside, and he shut the door. Now then! he said to the toad when the four of them stood together in the hall. First of all, take those ridiculous things off. Shot, replied toad. You take them off him then, you two, ordered the badger briefly. And they had to lay toad out on the floor, kicking and calling him all sorts of names before they could get it to work properly. And then the rat sat on him and the mole got his motor cloths, oh, cloths off him, clothes off him bit by bit and they stood him up on his legs again. And now that he was merely Toad, and no longer the terror of the highway, he giggled feebly and looked from one to the other appealingly, seemingly, seeming quite to understand the situation. You must know that it must have come to this sooner or later, Toad, the badger explained severely. You have disregarded all the warnings we've given you. You've gone on squandering the money your father left you, and you're getting us animals a bad name in the district, with your furious driving and your smashes and your rows with the police. He took Toad firmly by the arm and led him into the smoking room, closed the door behind them. Oh, that's no good, said the rat contemptuously. Talking to Toad's never going to cure him. He'll say anything. They made themselves comfortable in armchairs and waited patiently. And through the closed door, they could hear the long, continuous drone of the badger. <laughs> After some three quarters of an hour, the door opened and the badger reappeared, solemnly leading by the paw a very limp and dejected toad. Sit down there, toad, said the badger kindly, pointing to a chair. My friends, he went on, I am pleased to inform you that toad has at last seen the error of his ways. He is truly sorry for his misguided conduct in the past, and he has undertaken to give up motor cars entirely and forever. I have his solemn promise to that effect. Well, that is very good news, said the Mole gravely. Oh, uh, very good news indeed, observed the Rat dubiously. There's only one more thing to be done, continued the gratified Badger. Toad, come here. I want you to solemnly repeat before your friends here what you admitted to me in the smoking room just now. First... That you are sorry for what you have done, and that you see the folly of it all. There was a long, long pause. No, he said a little sullenly, but stoutly. I'm not sorry, and it, it wasn't folly at all. It was simply glorious. What? cried the badger, greatly scandalised. You backsliding animal, didn't you tell me in there just now? Oh, yes, oh yes, in there, yes, uh, said the toad impatiently. Well, I've, I've said anything in there. You're so eloquent, toad, and, and so moving and convincing, and you, you put all your points so frightfully well, and you can do what you like with me in there, and you know it. Told you so, didn't I? observed the rat to the mole. Very well, then, said the badger firmly. Take him upstairs, you two. Lock him in his bedroom while we arrange matters between ourselves. It's for your own good, Toady, you know, said the rat kindly as Toad, kicking and struggling, was hauled up the stairs. No more of those regrettable incidents with the police, Toad, said the rat as they thrust him into his bedroom and turned the key on him. They arranged watches accordingly. Each animal took it in turns to sleep in Toad's room at night, and they divided the day up between them. And one fine morning, the rat, whose turn it was to go on duty, went upstairs to relieve Badger. How are you today, old chap? inquired the rat cheerfully as he approached Toad's bedside. He had to wait some minutes for an answer, and at last 
a feeble voice replied, Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, dear Rattie. So good of you to inquire, but do not trouble about me. I hate being a burden to my friends, and I, oh, 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 I do not expect to, one, to be one much longer. Indeed, I almost hope not. Well, I hope so too, said the rat heartily. You've been a fine bother us, to us this whole time, I'm, and I'm glad to hear it's going to stop. Well, I'm afraid it is the trouble that you mind, though, replied the toad languidly. I, I can quite understand it. It's natural enough. You're... Uh, you're tired of bothering about me. I'm a nuisance, I know. Yeah, you are indeed, said the rat. But I'll tell you, I'd, I'd take any trouble on earth for you if only you'd be a sensible animal. If I thought that, Ratty, murmured Toad more feebly than ever, then I would beg you, oh, for the last time probably, to, to step round to the village as quickly as possible. Because even now it might be too late and... Uh, <coughs> Fetch the doctor. What? What do you want a doctor for? inquired the rat, coming closer and examining him. Well, surely you've noticed of late, murmured Toad. But oh no, why should you? Noticing things is only a trouble. Oh, tomorrow, indeed, you may be saying to yourself, Oh, if only I'd noticed sooner, if only I'd done something. Oh, but no, no, it's a trouble. Oh, never mind. Forget that I asked. Look here, old man, said the rat, beginning to get rather alarmed. Well, of, of course I'll fetch a doctor to you, but you can hardly be bad enough for that yet. Let's talk about something else, eh? Well, I fear, dear friend, said Toad with a sad smile, that talk, oh, talk can do very little in a case like this, or, or doctors either. <laughs> oh, and by the way, while you're about it, I hate to give you additional trouble, but would you mind at the same time asking... A lawyer to step up. A lawyer? Oh, oh, he must be really bad, the affrighted rat said to himself as he hurried from the room, not forgetting, however, to lock the door carefully behind him. Outside, he stopped to consider. Well, it's best to be on the safe side. So he ran off to the village on his errand of mercy. The toad, who had hopped lightly out of bed as soon as he heard the key turn on the lock, watched him eagerly from the window till he disappeared down the carriage drive, and then, <laughs> laughing heartily, he dressed as quickly as possible in the smartest suit he could lay his hands on, filled his pockets with cash, and next, knotting the sheets from his bed together and tying one end around the central mullion of the handsome Tudor window, he scrambled out, slid slightly lightly to the ground, and taking the opposite direction to the rat, he marched off light-heartedly, whistling, whistling a merry tune. <laughs> Smart piece of work, that, hmm, he remarked to himself, chuckling. <laughs> Poor old Ratty, eh? my, won't he catch it when the badger gets back? Oh, a worthy fellow, Ratty, with many good qualities, but a very little intelligence mm, and absolutely no education. And filled with conceited thoughts such as these, he strode along, his head in the air, till he reached a little town with a sign of the Red Lion swinging across the road halfway down the main street, reminded him that he had not breakfasted that day. It was about halfway through his meal when an only too familiar sound approaching down the street made him start and fall a trembling all over. The poop poop drew nearer and nearer, and the car could be heard to turn into the inn-yard and come to a stop. A toad had to hold on to the leg of the table to conceal his overmastering emotion. Now, presently, the party entered the coffee room, hungry, talkative and gay, and voluble in their experiences of the morning and the merits of the chariot that had brought them along so well. Toad listened eagerly, all ears for a time, until he could stand it no longer. He slipped out of the room quietly, he paid his bill at the bar, and as soon as he got outside, he sauntered around, quietly to the inn-yard. Ooh, 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 there can't be any harm, he said to myself, to himself, in my just looking at it. The car stood in the middle of the yard. Toad walked slowly around it, inspecting, criticising, musing deeply. I wonder, he said to himself presently, I wonder if the sort of car starts easily. The next moment, not knowing even how it came about, the old passion seized on Toad. As if in a dream, he found himself seated in the driver's seat. 
He pulled the lever and he swung the car round the yard and out of the archway. All sense of right and wrong, all fear of obvious consequences seemed temporarily suspended. He increased his pace, and as the car devoured the street and leapt forth through the open country, he was only conscious that he was towed once more. Towed at his best and highest. Towed the terror, the traffic queller, the lord of the lone trail before whom all must give way or be smitten into nothingness and everlasting night. He chanted as he flew, and the miles were eaten up under him as he sped. He knew not whither, fulfilling his instincts, living his hour, reckless of what might come to him. To my mind, observed the chairman of the bench of magistrates cheerfully, the only difficulty that presents itself in this otherwise very clear case is how can we possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian whom we see cowering in the dock before us? Let me see. He has been found guilty on the clearest evidence first of stealing a valuable motor car, secondly of driving to the public danger, and thirdly of gross impertinence to the rural police. Mr. Clark, will you tell us, please, what is this very stiffest penalty we can impose for each of these offences? The clerk scratched his nose with his pen. Oh, well, uh, supposing you were to say 12 months for the theft, which is mild, and uh, ooh, three years for the furious driving, which is lenient, and 15 years for the cheek, which was pretty bad sort of cheek, judging by what we've heard from the witness box. And those figures, if added together correctly, toss up to... Uh, <gasps> Nineteen years. First rate, said the chairman. Oh, so you'd better make it around twenty years to be on the safe side, concluded the clerk. Oh, an excellent suggestion, said the chairman approvingly. Prisoner, it is going to be twenty years for you this time, and mind, if you appear before us again, upon any charge whatsoever, we shall have to deal with you very seriously. And then the brutal minions of the law fell upon the hapless toad, loaded them with chains, and dragged them from the courthouse, shrieking, praying, protesting, till they reached the door of the grimmest dungeon that lay in the heart of the innermost keep. The rusty key creaked in the lock, the great door clanged behind them, and Toad was a helpless prisoner in the remotest dungeon in all the length and breadth of merry England. Toad flung himself at full length on the floor and abandoned himself to dark despair. <gasps> this is the end of everything. How can I hope to ever be set at large again? Now the jailer had a daughter who assisted her father in the lighter duties of his post. She was particularly fond of animals and this kind-hearted girl said to her father one day, Father, I can't bear to see that poor beast so unhappy. You can let me have the managing of him. You know how fond of animals I am. Her father replied that she could do what she liked with him. Now, cheer up, Toad, she said on entering, and sit up and dry your eyes and be a sensible animal. And do try to eat a bit of dinner. See, I bought you some of mine, hot from the oven. And she carried a tray with a, a cup of fragrant tea steaming on it and a plate piled up very high with hot buttered toast. Toad sat up, dried his eyes, sipped his tea and munched his toast and soon began talking freely about himself and the house he lived in and his doings there and how important he was and what a lot his friends thought of him. The jailer's daughter saw that the topic was doing him as much good as the tea, as indeed it was, and encouraged him to go on. Tell me about Toad Hall, she said. It sounds beautiful. Oh, oh, oh Toad Hall, oh, said the Toad proudly. There's an eligible uh, self-contained gentleman's residence. Very unique. Dating in part from the 14th century, but replete with every modern convenience, up-to-date sanitation, five minutes from church, post office and golf links, and Toad, his spirits quite restored to the usual level, went on and told her about the fun that they had there when the other animals were gathered around the table, and Toad was at his best, singing songs, telling stories, carrying on generally. Over time, the jailer's daughter grew very sorry for Toad and thought it was a great shame that a poor little animal should be locked up in prison for what seemed to her a very trivial offence. Toad, she said one morning, shh, 
just listen, please. I have an aunt who's a washerwoman. Uh, she does the washing for all the prisoners in the castle. Now, I think that if she were properly approached, you could come to some arrangement by which she would let you have her dress and bonnet and so on, and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. Well, you know, introduce me to your worthy aunt, if you'll be so kind, said Toad, and I have no doubt that the excellent lady and I will be able to arrange terms satisfactory to both parties. The next evening, the girl ushered her aunt into the Toad's cell, bearing his week's washing pinned up in a towel. The old lady had been prepared beforehand, and the sight of certain gold sovereigns that Toad had thoughtfully placed on the table left little further to discuss. Now, in return for his cash, Toad received a cotton print gown, an apron, a shawl, and a rusty black bonnet. The only stipulation that the old lady made being that she should be gagged and bound and dumped down into the corner. And Toad was delighted with that suggestion. It would enable him to leave the prison in some style and with his reputation for being a desperate and dangerous fellow untarnished. Oh, take off the coat and the waistcoat of yours, said the girl, shaking with laughter, and she proceeded to hook and eye him into the cotton print gown, arranged the shawl with a professional fold, and tied the strings of the rusty bonnet under his chin. Now, goodbye, Toad, and good luck. It seemed hours before he crossed the last courtyard, but at last, at last, he heard the wicker gate in the great outer door click behind him. He felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his anxious brow, and he knew that he was free. Dizzy with the easy success of his daring exploit, he walked quickly towards the lights of the town. And as he walked, his attention was caught by some red and green lights a little way off to one side of the town, and the sound of puffing and snorting of engines and the banging of shunted trucks fell on his ear. Ha, ha, ha! He thought, this is a piece of luck. A railway station, that's the thing I want most in the whole world at this moment. He gave the name of the station that he knew to be the nearest the village, of which Toad Hall was the principal feature, and mechanically put his fingers in search of the necessary money where his waistcoat pocket should have been. But to his horror, he recollected that he'd left both coat and waistcoat behind in a cell, and with them, his pocketbook, his money, his, his keys, his watch, his matches, pencil case, everything that makes life worth living. Ticketless, baffled, full of despair, he wandered blindly down the platform where the train was standing, tears trickling down either side of his nose. He found himself opposite the engine, which was being oiled, wiped and generally caressed by its affectionate driver, a burly man with an oil can in one hand and a lump of cotton waste in the other. Hello, mother, said the engine driver. What's the trouble, eh? You don't look particularly cheerful. Oh, sir, said Toad, crying afresh. <laughs> I'm a poor, unhappy washerwoman. I've lost all my money. I can't pay for a ticket, and I, I must get home tonight somehow, and whatever am I to do, I don't know. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, that's a very bad business indeed, said the engine driver reflectively. Lost your money? You can't get home. You've got some kids too waiting for you, I dare say. Oh, oh, yes, oh, any amount of them, sobbed Toad. And they'll be uh, the hungry, and they'll, they'll play with matches, and, and, and upsetting lamps, all oh, the little innocents, and they'll be quarrelling and going on generally. Oh, oh dear, oh dear. I'll tell you what I'll do, said the good engine driver. You're a washerwoman to your trade, and I'm an engine driver, and there's no denying it. It's terribly dirty work. You wash a few shirts for me when you get home. I'll give you a ride on my engine. The toad's misery turned into rapture as he eagerly scrambled up into the cab of the engine. Of course, he'd never washed a shirt in his life, and he couldn't if he tried, and anyhow, he wasn't going to begin. But he thought, oh, when I get safely home to Toad Hall and I have money again, I'll send the engine driver enough to pay for quite a quantity of washing. Hmm. They covered many a many a mile, and Toad was already considering what he'd have for supper as soon as he got home, when he noticed that the engine driver, with a puzzled expression on his face, was leaning over the side of the engine, listening hard. That's very strange. We're the last train running in this direction tonight, yet I could swear I heard another following us. Toad ceased his frivolous antics at once. Well, yeah, I can see it clearly now. It is. It's an engine on our rails coming along at a great place. And it, it looks as if we're being pursued. 
The miserable toad, crouching in the coal dust, tried hard to think of something to do with dismal want of success. They're gaining on us fast, cried the engine driver, and the engine is, is crowded with warders waving halberds, and a gent policemen in their helmets waving truncheons, and plain clothes detectives waving revolvers and walking sticks. They're all shouting the same thing. Stop! 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 Toad fell on his knees among the coals. <laughs> save me! Save me, save me, dear, kind Mr. Engine Driver. And I, I will confess everything. I, I'm not the simple washerwoman I seem to be. I have no children waiting for me. I am Toad, the well-known and popular Mr. Toad, a landed proprietor. And I've just escaped from a loathsome dungeon, dungeon into which my en enemies had flung me. And if those fellows on that engine recapture me, It'll be chains and bread and water and straw and misery once more for poor, unhappy, innocent Toad. The engine driver looked down very upon him very sternly and he said, Oh, you tell me the truth. What were you put in prison for? I only borrowed a motor car while the owners were at lunch. <laughs> they had no need of it at the time. I didn't mean to steal it, really. But people, especially magistrates, take such harsh views of thoughtless and high-spirited actions. The engine driver looked very grave and said, You are evidently in sore trouble and distress. I will not desert you. Now, a short way ahead is a, a long tunnel, and on the other side of that line, it passes through a thick wood. Now, I'll put on all the speed I can while we're running through the tunnel, for the other fellows will slow down a bit, naturally, for fear of an accident. And when we're through, I'll shut off steam, I'll put on the brakes as hard as I can, and a moment it's safe for you to you know, jump and you hide in the wood before they get through the tunnel and see you. They piled on more coals, and the train shot into the tunnel, and the engine rushed and roared and rattled, till at last they shot out the other end into the fresh air and the peaceful moonlight. And they saw the wood lying dark and helpful upon the other side of the line. The driver shut off steam and put on brakes. The toad got down on the step, and as the train slowed down almost to a walking pace, he heard the driver call out, Now! Jump! Toad jumped! He rolled down a short embankment, picked himself up unhurt, scrambled into the wood, and hid. Cold, hungry, and tired out, he sought the shelter of a hollow tree, where with branches and dead leaves he made himself as comfortable a bed as he could, and he slept soundly until the morning. Next day, as he tramped along gaily, he thought of his adventures and escapes, and how when things seemed at their worst, he'd always managed to find a way out, and his pride and his conceit began to swell within him. Hoo, 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 he said to himself, as he marched along with his chin in the air. Ooh, what a clever toad I am. After some miles of country lanes, he reached the high road, and as he turned into it and glanced along its white length, he saw, approaching him, a speck, a speck that turned into a dot, then into a blob, and then into something very familiar. A double note of warning, poop, poop, and only too well known, it fell on his delighted ear. <gasps> this is something like, said the excited toad, it's his real life again. This is once more the great world from which I miss so long. I will hail them, and with luck it may even end, I may even end driving up to Toad Hall in a motor car. That will be one in the eye for old Badger. Huh? He stepped confidently out into the road to hail the motor car, which came along at an easy pace, slowing down as it neared the lane, when suddenly he became very pale. His heart turned to water, his knees shook and yielded under him, and he doubled up and collapsed with a sickening pain in his interior. And well he might, the unhappy animal, for the approaching car was the very one he had stolen out of the yard at the Red Lion Hotel that fateful day when all his troubles began. And the people were in it. They were the very same people he had sat and watched at luncheon in the coffee room. He sank down in a shabby, miserable heap in the road, murmuring to himself in despair, Oh, no, oh, it's all up, it's all over now. Oh, what a fool I've been. The terrible motor car drew up slowly, nearer and nearer, till at last he heard it stop just short of him. And two gentlemen got out and walked around the trembling heap of crumbled misery lying in the road, and one of them said, Oh dear, this is very sad. You know, there's a, a poor old thing, a washerwoman apparently, who's fainted in the road. Oh, 
But let her lift, let, we'll lift her into the car and take her to the nearest village, where doubtless she has friends. They tenderly lifted Toad into the motor car and propped him up with soft cushions and proceeded on their way. Oh, look, said one of the gentlemen, she's better already. The fresh air is doing her good. Well, how do you feel now, ma'am? Oh, thank you kindly, sir, said Toad in a feeble voice. I'm feeling a great deal better. Oh, that's right, said the gentleman. They'll keep you keep quiet still. Above all, don't try to talk. They won't, <laughs> said the Toad. But, uh, I was uh, <clears throat> only thinking if, if I might sit on the front seat there beside the driver where I could get the fresh air full on my face, I should soon be all right again. Oh, what a very sensible woman, said the gentleman. Of course you shall. So they carefully helped Toad into the front seat beside the driver and they went on again. Toad was almost himself again by now. He sat up, looked about him, and tried to beat down the tremors and the yearnings, the old cravings that rose up and beset him and took possession of him entirely. Please, sir, he said, I, I wish you would kindly let me try and drive the car for a little bit. You know, I, I've been watching you very carefully and it looks so interesting and so easy and I, sh I should like to be able to tell my friends that I'd once driven a motor car. When the gentleman heard, he said to Toad's delight, Oh, bravo, ma'am. Oh, I like your spirit. Let her have a try. Look after her. She won't do any harm. Toad eagerly scrambled into the front seat, vacated by the driver. He took the steering wheel in both hands and listened with affected humility to the instructions given him and set the car in motion, very slowly and carefully at first, for he was determined to be prudent. The gentlemen behind clapped their hands and applauded. <laughs> and Toad heard them saying, How well she does it, eh? Fancy a washerwoman driving a car as well as that for the first time. Toad went a little faster, and then faster still, and faster. He heard the gentleman call out warningly, Oh, be careful, washerwoman! And this annoyed him, and he began to lose his head. The driver tried to interfere, but he pinned him down in the seat with one elbow, and he put on full speed. Washerwoman, indeed! He shouted recklessly, I am Toad, the motor car snatcher, the prison breaker. Sit still. Oh, you shall know what driving really is, for you are in the hands of the famous, the skillful, and the entirely fearless Toad. With a cry of horror, the whole party rose. They flung themselves on him. Seize him, they cried. Drag him to the nearest police station. Alas, with a half turn of the wheel, the toad sent the car crashing through the low hedge that ran under, along the roadside. And one mighty bound, a violent shock, and Toad found himself flying, flying through the air with a strong upward rush and delicate curve of a swallow. He liked the motion. And he was just beginning to wonder whether it would go on until he developed wings and turned into a toad bird when he landed kaboomf, on his back with a thump in the soft, rich grass of a meadow. Sitting up, he could just see the motor car nearly submerged in a pond, the gentleman and the driver floundering helplessly in the water. He picked himself up rapidly and he set off running across country as hard as he could till he was breathless and weary and had to settle down into an easy walk. And when he had recovered his breath somewhat, and he was able to think calmly, he began <laughs> to giggle. <laughs> and from giggling, <laughs> he took to laughing, and he laughed so hard that he had to sit down under a hedge. <laughs> How clever I am. How clever. How very clever. How clever. Suddenly the earth failed under his feet. He grasped at the air and he splashed. He found himself head over heels into the river. Down he went. <laughs> Came up breathless and spluttering. <laughs> and then he saw that he was approaching a big dark hole in the bank just above his head. And as the stream bore him past, he reached up with a paw and he caught hold of the edge and he held on. And then slowly and with difficulty, he drew himself up out of the water. And there he remained for some minutes, puffing and panting, for he was quite exhausted. <sighs> he sighed and he blew and he stared before him into the dark hole. And some small bright thing shone and twinkled in its depths, moving towards him. As it approached, a face grew up gradually around it, and it was a familiar face. 
brown and small, with whiskers, grave and round, with neat ears and silky hair. It was the water rat. The rat gripped Toad firmly by the scruff of the neck and gave him a great hoist in a pool, and the waterlogged Toad came up and stood safe and sound in the hall. Toad, said the water rat gravely and firmly, you go off upstairs at once, and you take off that old cotton rag and clean yourself thoroughly, and you put on some of my clothes, try to come down looking like a gentleman, if you can. By the time he came down, luncheon was on the table, and very glad Toad was to see it. And while they ate, Toad told the rat all about his adventures, dwelling chiefly on his own cleverness and presence of mind in emergencies. But the more he talked and boasted, the more grave and silent the rat became. When at last Toad had talked himself to a standstill, there was silence for a while, and then the rat said, Now, uh, Toady, uh, I don't want to give you pain after all you've been through already, but seriously, don't you see what an awful ass you've been making of yourself? You've never had anything but trouble from motor cars from the moment you first set eyes on them. Who? You? Quite right, Ratty. <laughs> yes, I have. I have been a conceited old ass. I can see that now. I am going to be a good toad and I'm not going to do it anymore. We'll have our coffee and we'll have a quiet chat and now I'm going to stroll quietly back down to Toad Hall. What? St stroll quietly to Toad Hall? Quite cried the rat, greatly excited. What? what are you talking about? I mean, don't you, Dad, you mean to say you haven't heard? Heard what? said Toad, turning rather pale. Oh, go on, Ratty. Quick, don't spare me. What haven't I heard? When you got into that trouble of yours, said the rat slowly and impressively, well, it was a good deal talked about down here, naturally, continued the rat. And we, we riverbankers, we stuck up for you. We said you'd been infamously treated, but the wild woods animals, oh, they said hard things. It served you right. And it was time this sort of thing was stopped. And they went about saying, you're done for this time. You'd never come back again. Never, never. So, one dark night, a band of weasels, armed to the teeth, crept silently up the carriage drive to the front entrance of Toad Hall. And simultaneously, a body of desperate ferrets, advancing through the kitchen garden, possessed themselves of the backyard and offices, while a company of skirmishing stoats occupied the conservatory in the billiard room. Now, the mole and badger, they were sitting by the fire in the smoking room, telling stories and suspecting nothing, when these bloodthirsty villains, they broke down the doors and they rushed in upon them from every side. Oh, they made the very best fight they could, but what was the good? They were unarmed. What can two animals do again? Hundreds. And they, they turned them out into the cold and wet. And our wild wooders have been living in Toad Hall ever since. Ooh, help they, said Toad, getting up and seizing a stick. Oh, jolly, we'll soon see about that. No, 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 it's no good, Toad. They got sentries posted. They're all armed. You just have to wait. They finished their meal and resumed their armchairs. When there came a heavy knock at the door, then walked Mr. Badger. Welcome home, Toad. Oh, that's what am I saying? Home indeed. Oh, oh, this is a poor homecoming. He turned his back on him. He sat down at the table, drew his chair up, and helped himself to a large slice of cold pie. And presently, there came another and a lighter knock, and the rat ushered in the mall very shabby and unwashed, with bits of hay and straw sticking in his fur. Hooray! Hey, here's old Toad, cried the mole, his face beaming. Oh, 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 fancy having you back again! And he began to dance around him. <laughs> we never dreamt you'd turn up so soon. Mole, said the rat, please tell us as soon as possible what the position is and what's best to be done now that Toad is back at last. Oh, well, the position's about as bad as it can be, replied the mole. The badger and I have been around and round the place by night and by day. It's always the same thing. Sentries posted everywhere, guns poked at us, stones thrown at us, always an animal on the lookout. Well, there are more ways of getting back a place than taking it by storm, said the badger. Now, I'm going to tell you a great secret. There is an underground passage, said the badger impressively, that leads from the water bank near here, right up into the middle of Toad Hall. 
There's going to be a big banquet tomorrow night at somebody's birthday, the Chief Weasels, I believe, and all the weasels will be gathered together in the dining hall, eating, drinking, and laughing, and carrying on, suspecting nothing. And that is where the passage comes in. That tunnel leads right up under the butler's pantry next to the dining hall. We shall creep quietly out of the butler's pantry, cried the Mole, with our swords and our, sis and our pistols and our sticks, and, and we'll rush in upon them. And, oh, we'll whack em and whack em and whack em, cried the toad in ecstasy, running around the room and jumping over the chairs. Very well, then, said the badger, resuming his usual dry manner. Our plan is settled. There's nothing more for you to argue and squabble about, and it's getting very late. All of you go off to bed right at once, and we'll make all necessary arrangements in the course of the morning tomorrow. Toad. Slept till a late hour next morning, and by the time he got down, he found that the other animals had finished their breakfast some time before. The mole had slipped off somewhere by himself, and Badger sat in the armchair reading the paper. The rat, on the other hand, was running around the room busily with his arms full of weapons of every kind, distributing them in four little heaps upon the floor, and saying excitedly under his breast, Ah, yeah, here's a, here's a sword, here's a sword for rat, and here's a sword for mole, and there's a, a pistol for the toad, and there's a pistol for the badger. That's all very well, Rat, said the Badger, but once we get past the stoats with those detestable guns of theirs, I assure you, we won't want any swords or pistols. Now, once we're inside that dining hall, we should clear the floor of all of the lot of them in five minutes with our sticks. Well, it's all very, it's, we'd better be on the safe side, said the Rat reflectively, polishing a pistol barrel on his sleeve and looking upon it. Uh, presently, the mole came tumbling into the room, evidently very pleased with themselves. <laughs> I've been getting a rise out of the stoat sentries. Oh, I hope you've been very careful, mole, said the rat anxiously. Oh, I should hope so too, said the rat confidently. See, I found that old washerwoman's dress that Toad came home in. So I, I put it on and the bonnet and the shawl, and I went to Toad Hall. And the sentries, they were on the lookout, of course, with their guns, and oh! Good morning, gentlemen, says I. Want any washing done today? Go away, washerwoman. We don't do any washing. Go on. We're on duty. Run away, you good woman. Run away. Oh, well, it, it won't be me that's going to be running away in a very short time from now. <laughs> so let me tell you this. My daughter works for Mr. Badger and a hundred bloodthirsty badgers, armed with rifles, are going to t attack Toad Hall this very night. And uh, uh, six boatloads of rats with pistols and cutlasses are going to come up the river, while a picked body of toads, known as the Die Hards or the Death of Glory Toads, will storm up the orchard, yelling for vengeance. You silly ass mole! cried Toad. You've gone and spoiled everything. Mole! said the badger. I perceive that you have more sense in your little finger than some other animals have in their fat little bodies. You have spread panic and managed excellency, and I begin to have great hopes for you. Good mole, oh, clever mole. Toad was simply wild with jealousy, couldn't make out for the life of him what the mole had done that was so particularly clever. Well, we've got our work cut out for us tonight, announced Badger, and it'll probably be pretty late before we're quite through with it. So, I'm just going to take 40 winks, and while I can. And he drew a handkerchief over his face, and he soon was snoring. <clears throat> when it began to grow dark, the rat summoned them back into the parlour and proceeded to dress them up for the coming expedition. At first, there was a belt to go round each animal, and then a sword to be stuck into each belt, and then a cutlass on the other side to balance it, and then a pair of pistols, a policeman's truncheon, several sets of handcuffs, some bandages and sticking plaster, and a flask and a sandwich case. The badger laughed good-humouredly. <laughs> all right, Ratty, I'm going to do all I've got to do with this here stick. When all was quite ready, the badger took a dark lantern in one paw, grasped his great stick with the other, and he said... Now then, follow me. Mole first, because I'm very pleased with him. Rat next, and Toad last. But look here, Toady. Don't chatter so much as usual, or you'll be sent back home. The animals set off. Badger led them along the river for a little way, and then suddenly swung himself over the edge into a hole in the river bank, a little above the water. The secret passage was cold, and dark, and damp, and low, and narrow. 
I groped and they shuffled along with their ears pricked up and their paws on their pistols till at last the badger said, We ought by now to be pretty nearly under the hall. And then suddenly they heard, far away as it might be and yet apparently nearly over their heads, a confused murmur of sound as if people were shouting and cheering and stamping on the floor and hammering on the tables. And the badger remarked placidly, They are going for it, the weasels. The passage now began to slope upwards. They groped onward a little further, and then the noise broke out again, quite distinct this time, and very close above them. Hooray! 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 hooray they heard, and the stamping of little feet on the floor, and the clinking of glasses as little fists pounded on the table. They hurried along the passage till they found themselves standing under the trap door that led up into the butler's pantry. Such a tremendous noise was going on in the banqueting hall, there was very little danger of them being overheard. And the badger said, Now, oh, boys, all together, push! And the noise as they emerged from the passage was simply deafening. The badger drew himself up, took a firm grip of his stick with both paws. He glanced around at his comrades and he cried, The hour has come! Follow me! And he flung the door open wide. My! What a squealing and a squeaking and a screeching filled the air. Well might the terrified weasels dive under the tables and spring madly up at the windows. Well might the ferrets rush wildly for the fireplace and get hopelessly jammed in the chimney. And well might tables and chairs be upset and glass and china be sent crashing to the floor in the panic of that terrible moment when the four heroes strode wrathfully into the room. The mighty badger, his whiskers bristling, his great cudgel whistling through the air. Mole, black and grim, brandishing his stick and shouting his awful war cry. A mole! A mole! Rat, desperate and determined, his belt bulging with weapons of every age and of every variety. Toad, frenzied with excitement and injured pride, swollen to twice his ordinary size, leaping into the air and admitting toad whoops that chilled him to the marrow. He went straight for the chief weasel. They were but four in all, but to the panic-stricken weasels, the hall seemed full of monstrous animals. Grey, black, brown and yellow, whooping and, and flourishing enormous cudgels, and they broke and they fled with squeals of terror and dismay. This way, that way, through the windows, up the chimney, anywhere to get out of the reach of those terrible, terrible sticks. The affair was soon over. Up and down the whole length of the hall strode the four friends, out whacking with their sticks at every head that showed itself, and in five minutes the room was cleared. The badger, resting from his labours, bade the others set a table up on its legs again, and pick up the knives and forks and plates and glasses from the debris on the floor, and generally rewrite the room. So they finished their supper in great joy and contentment, and presently retired to rest safe in Toad's and Central Home, won back by matchless valour, consummate strategy, and a proper handling of sticks. After this climax, the four animals continued to lead their lives so rudely broken in upon by civil war and great joy and contentment, undisturbed by further risings or invasions. And sometimes in the course of the long summer evenings, the friends would take a stroll together in the wild wood, now successfully tamed as far as they were concerned, and it was pleasing to see how respectfully they were greeted by the inhabitants and how the mother weasels would bring their young ones to the mouths of their hole and say, pointing, Look, baby, there goes the great Mr. Toad. And that, that's the gallant Mr. Water Rat. He's a terrible fighter. That's walking along with them. Oh, and yonder, there comes the famous Mr. Mole, of whom you've so often heard your father tell. And when their infants were fractious and quite beyond control, they would quiet them by telling how, if they didn't hush and not fret them, that terrible grey badger would come and get them. Now this was base libel on Badger, who though, though he cared little for society, was rather fond of children. But it never failed to have its full effect. The End And thank you for sharing that with me.